You are now tuned into the truth frequency. Your protection from deception. T-L-R. Truth Frequency Radio. If you have a questioning nature and a desire to nourish your essence within you have reached the realm of truth, live from inner space, it's the next sequel to Interactive Enlightenment, brought to you by your host, Seven Bomar. Enjoy non-stop breakthroughs, advanced knowledge, and self-discovery to the core of your very essence. Join us as we map the blueprint to the cosmos and dissolve the mysteries of the Matrix. You are now connected to the Keymaker. All right, all right, here we go. It's uh, Saturday, and this is the next episode of The Keymaker, episode six, Light Being. And of course, you know, we're moving right along with the Keymaker series. I mean, you know, it's got raving reviews at this point. People are saying it's really hitting the spot and for uh, really answering a lot of the, not so much as the questions, but, you know, the personal touch that's necessary, you know, when we're going through this experience and, you know, I, I'm really big on not rehashing things and, you know, just going back all over and over again to just the, you know, the same old story, looking for new answers, you know, that actually that, I think that divines insanity, you know, doing the same thing over and over again to expect some kind of different result. And so I definitely, um, always look forward to these shows because it challenges us to actually learn something. And I think that that's the that's a big part of all of this is if you can learn or if you're learning something, that means that you didn't know it before. Uh, if you're reciting something that someone else already dictated, then, you know, it, it, it could equal some stagnancy there unless it happens to be 100 percent accurate. And, and one thing that I will say is since a lot of the information that we've come across these days, you know, especially from what's supposed to be, quote unquote, ancient times. None of us are, were there per se to verify what went on. Then that just means that we either have to take someone's word for it and and actually believe it, and then see how that works. But of course, you know we have something else that we can we can look deeper into things about, and that's definitely this blueprint, as we call it, or the as above, so below nature to everything that we should always look for as a stamp of authentication that something is actually true, or else. What we end up with is a bunch of information that is, in fact, disinformation, and then it makes it hard for us to put things together. So today's show is going to be about clarifying some things. Uh, so we're going to go to the heights, and then we're going to go as, as deep as possible after that. So that way, you know, it starts to become clear what we're really involved with here when we're talking about spiritual progress and life on, pla on this planet and life in the astral plane. And, you know, I also believe that one of the major things about all of this is, is that our culture, because we have to admit that if anyone's, first of all, listening to this message and you comprehend it in English, that means that you're coming from a Western culture generally. So the Western culture, is, is, as it is, is deified itself within its religions. In fact, that's the whole purpose of religion is the deification of the culture. And that means the culture actually makes this leap into where it tries to fill the place of what we would call God or supreme being. But what's most important to remember about English is that it's rather new. And a lot of the concepts that are put across in English is, are directly related to a lot of the results that we get within our culture. And one of those major results is the childlike behavior and the childlike belief system of the populace at large, the Santa Claus and Mary had the little lamb and, and all those different things. We have to ask ourselves, you know, what that manifests into later on in life when we still haven't learned what it's like to be adept or adult and in control of every part of our being. So 
that's the the pretext to today's show is is to go into your adepthood or go into your adulthood and then realize what it is that you need to begin to accept about your existence and how you're here on this planet and what you're doing here and what you've been doing in your immortality. And to get that connection, it's going to take for us to, what I would say, fess up to things instead of trying to find scapegoats or trying to find people that are responsible for our demise or even going at others and saying that they're doing it wrong or they're doing it right. You know, that's all a part of the blame game. When we make ourselves responsible for our progress and our descent, our descent and our ascent, then we have achieved Godhead, if you may, or our supremeness because we're in control. That means that anything that we want or what we don't want is based upon our own frequencies and our own actions. So that's what we're looking to get into. So the first thing I want to say today is, you know, this is one of the most exciting times to be alive. Uh, There is definitely a full awakening going on within many of the beings, but I can only speak for myself because I'm in my own body. And I feel like, you know, that the past years, you know, 20 years ago, even let's say 30 years ago, I guess I can go back, back that far. I'm 36 now, have been almost like a blur in a tense to how much I can really say that I've been present within my own consciousness. So that's why I say it's an exciting time to be alive because I feel so present within my consciousness. And a lot of that comes from taking a lot of responsibility. And I think that we have this this grand revelation within ourselves. And it occurs when we start taking the responsibility. So it's almost like you can hear the same information over and over again. But that information can come to you different kind of ways depending upon your own personal frequency. And that's why we always talk about our filter system, which is the chakras and our levels of perception, the orifices within our bodies. Those are all the areas that we take in things. And so when that system has been perfected by ourselves or what we call cleanse, you clean your filters, then your level of perception of what may be mentioned sometimes can be, well, will be and will reflect the clarity of your filter. So if someone tells you something and you're completely clear, it's, if it has some fallacy to it, it's very difficult for you to believe it versus if you're all foggy, you may even entertain it. So in every tense, and let me just get some of my systems together here because I got some noise coming in, but in every tense, it takes the responsibility. So when we're ready to do that, that's when we're going to have these major uh, epiphanies and these major breakthroughs. And that this culture that we're living in has set it up so that grown adults, <laughs> meaning you know, 25, 30, 40, 50, even 60-year-olds, are still in that childlike mentality of not realizing how serious this is about their progress and how much is accessible right now for them because it's often pushed off to, well, what can I do, you know, right now for this hour or, you know, I got my my thing coming on later on or I got to be somewhere next week. So it's everything but you know what exactly I need to be doing to expand my consciousness. So I'm going to clear some things up for everyone. And, uh, and it's going to make things very clear about where you are and, and how this really works. So the first thing is, is that we're putting things into their proper perspective, okay? But the whole goal of learning, as I said, means that you didn't know it before. So a big part of the Keymaker series is to rearrange what we may believe is true into what is really true and put it into the proper place based on how we can connect it with facts, okay? So facts are we breathe in and we breathe out, okay? So that means that our existence is internal and external. It's not one or the other, it's both. So that's the whole creation in itself. That's why they call it the yin and the yang, right? These are old ancient symbols, though it doesn't say the yin. (laughs) So for a person who just wants to only be internal in a physical plane, they're going to find that to be quite difficult, if not impossible, because that's not the creation. That's not the child, let's say the manifestation that has been brought forth here that we're living in, that we must accept responsibility to 
is a yin and a yang. So the responsibility is it requires us to keep it balanced. And, you know, I think we've gone through about a year and a half of consistently drilling into what is really balanced and how important it really is. We've talked about even in the symbolism of, of Hermes or the Kadesha staff, that the Kadesha staff is a balancing rod and it relates to frequency. It was often seen almost as a, a tool or let's say, I can't even use the term a weapon, but something that is so powerful that it can nullify the effects of anything because it's a balancing rod. So if you have something coming at you that is extremely dangerous and has equal peril for others, then all you have to do is hit it with the balancing rod. And in that balance, it nullifies it just as two frequencies that are on the same wavelength or, or two frequencies even that are equally diametrically opposed when fired at each other, they cancel each other out. So that's how we achieve balance on this plane is that we must find the yin to the yang. We must find the internal to the external in order to solve them. And that's why the term is solve it co coagula. Find the formula that's going to give you the solution to what you're dealing with in the reality by placing that in balance. So that way you don't have this anxiety. You don't have this anxiousness. You don't have this off balance system that keeps you from focusing. So in short, we've seen what happens when people go too far within, you know, nowadays, you know, that's especially within the new age movement is seen as that that's not possible. A person can't possibly go too far within. But I will say I've seen many people that have gone so deep into the recesses of their consciousness that for them to be even able to adapt to this external reality and what's going on right now. And, you know, what will go on for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years or however long you will exist here becomes very tough for them and they have a hard time adapting. But likewise, we have these other people who go too far out, meaning that they're so desensitized from their spiritual consciousness that they don't even realize that they actually are spiritual beings. And I've run across some of these people, too, and some of them don't even dream. Some of them don't actually even talk in their mind. I remember actually meeting a person on a part of my journey that never knew that he could actually talk in his own mind. Now, for some people, that may seem ridiculous because they've been talking to themselves since what they feel like is day one. But you have to understand that this is a big world. So when we generalize things, especially cosmic beings, we will only find misinterpretations and misunderstandings because unless you have a mind that is vast as that you've experienced life in Haiti and you've experienced what it's like to be in Gaza and you've, you know, you walk with the mommies and titas in Colombia and then you've been back in the hood with the cats in Florida in the deep south and you've been. So if you don't have a profile like that to where you can recall all of those frequencies and all those existences. It does mean that when you're trying to judge something, you need some kind of bearing to allow you to get the truth out of what you're seeing. And mainly, if you're just judging it to be, oh, it's good or it's bad, then you are definitely missing the other side. Because this would be like, you know, when court, jury and everyone gets together and they attempt to convict someone for the crime that they committed in that instance. They may not see what had gone on prior to that that caused that individual to go into that particular mindset. You see, so there's more to the story is what I'm saying. There's more to our experience here on Earth than just making a couple words up like, oh, they're wrong or oh, they're right. And then concluding it and slamming the gavel as if it's our place to be doing that. And so think about it. If you are on God level for per se, you know, and you want to judge, that means that you need to be all seeing and all knowing that way you can actually judge correctly. So this show is about actually judging yourself. It's actually about make, uh, taking into account a sober estimate of yourself daily to make sure that you haven't imagined that you're more or less than what you have achieved to this point. And you need those kind of calibrations in your hyperdimensional vehicle. 
You need to understand exactly where your fuel levels are, your energy levels are. And this takes for you to be very truthful and honest with yourself. So to clarify things even more, because, you know, as we say, as above, so below, but many people, they don't get that because they're like, well, how does that even work? Because so where is this connection of me on this high level? Because all I'm really experiencing right now is this low level or this physical reality, this physical plane where, you know, diff it's different than the, the sea or the sky. I'm actually on earth and I'm standing on this rock of dust, right? And, and coagulated dust and minerals. So rather than, you know, going headlong into for day in, day out of whether it's flat or circular or not, the fact is, is that if I can pull a handful of dirt out of the ground, then that gives me enough to know that I'm on some kind of foundation. And that foundation has actually been accumulated over an unlimited or uncountable amount of time of all the different species and life forms that have lived here, like just like if, we, if you look into things like zeolite and things like uh, diatomaceous earth, these organisms that are actually in there, the fossils are millions of years old, and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference unless you've gone under a microscope and see, okay, well, yeah, this is a, a, a single-cell crustacean that has existed for a prolonged period of time, and now it just looks like, to me, it looks like dirt. So there's an accumulation here, and this is the thing that we should always remember when we start to identify even other spiritual forms. Instead of, you know, sending them all out into space and saying, oh, you know, they came from another planet, we have to understand that there have been people here, human beings and the likes, you know, different kind of species of animals that have left physicality, but their resonance, their vibration, and their frequency remain, especially if they acted out their character in a very strong way. And for many, for many uh, instances, that becomes the real explanation to what we're dealing with when we're talking about negative forces or when we're talking about aliens and those kind of things. So first remembering that we breathe in and we breathe out in this, we have to see that when you're talking about the height, what you'll be dealing with is just light. Okay, so outside of the matrix, everything is just light. So the reason why there's no conflict, and we talked about this last show a little bit, but why there's no conflict outside of the illusion. Because see, here we're experiencing these wars. You know, we got all this judging. Basically, we got red, we got blue. And all of those combinations, male and female and dog and cat, and the list goes on and on and on and on. So anyone in the matrix that's acting like somehow that they don't understand why all this stuff is going on and it's just so terrible and blah, 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 blah. These are all the babies that haven't grown up to the main lesson of what goes on inside of the illusion of duality. So that means that it's almost like not waking up to the dream. So, of course, if a person has been bred and actually been breeded to believe that death is the final stop for everything and that there actually is no real spiritual world, which is what most of these religious traditions, they really hang on, that you don't actually even get involved into the spiritual planes really too heavy. I mean, you're really supposed to read the book, but only into the, the holiness and the, and the Pentecostals and, 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 and even shamanism, which can't even be put in that category, do you even start to really assess the domain of the spiritual realm? Other than that, these, these religions, they have only a person just basically bowing down and praying and waiting for whatever they're supposed to wait for when the whole thing is over with. So again, this is the culture of death because it centers around death being the major control point to everything. But that's false. That's the wall that's put up that a person can't see over. This is what's meant by that there's an ice wall on the flat earth. All this stuff is, is metaphoric. It should not actually be taken as actual. That ice wall is the limit to how far we can see. It's where you can't peer over there. Most people don't have the ability to peer beyond death. And even on a conscious level, when we try to expand our consciousness. If the death component is still in, the conscious 
uh, is still loaded. The consciousness can't actually expand beyond certain things. And this hampers our innovation, hampers our ability to invent, and it hampers our ability to create new things because that same wall that exists within our consciousness, it manifests in different ways. So I'll say it again, beyond the wall, you're all light. And in that light spectrum that you exist in, there is no conflict of what we call conflict. There is what we call merging. Because, see, light rays, they naturally merge and then make these different colors. And since everything is light and no one can argue with you about that, like I got papers here from NASA that continuously explain that everything is frequency and it's light. But what it doesn't keep, what, what it doesn't explain is how light becomes physicality. But we know how light becomes physicality because when light is slowed down, it actually becomes solids. Okay? And so... What we're experiencing then is that the merging of the lights on that as above level actually becomes conflicts on this as below level. So the sheer interaction between one thing and another thing coming at each other and actually causing some kind of friction to attempt to merge, like even when you're eating something, that in itself is the merger. So that's what you will witness when you go beyond this particular space time is that you'll see everything as light merging and, and connecting with each other. And then in, in physicality, you'll see it as even people coming to, into conflict and things actually consuming each other. And, you know, I advise everyone to, for a moment, just take a look at, I think it's uh, Plato's Republic, stanza seven, the cave. And it goes in detail about, you know, this parable about these people being in a cave and basically only beginning, only being able to witness the shadows that are on the wall. And that if someday they're actually let out of the cave, they won't actually be able to recognize where those shadows actually came from. And when you read all of this, what's being presented in this, uh, in these stanzas, what it actually begins to describe to you is not somebody's state in the past, but actually the state in the present of how when it's time for us to realize that everything is connected, the only thing that we can seem to do is want to take it all apart because we are designed that way. Our bipolarism being created from a male and a female, being created from light and darkness, being created from these opposing components creates a being truly that has the job, if not the duty in their existence, to put things together. And as we live in this body, we become like the universe in, in itself, united but in conflict. And that conflict only ends when we put it in order. That's why many people will tell you in, in the deeper uh, knowledge and the meditations, et cetera, that you're responsible and you're the only one that could be responsible for bringing yourself to happiness and bringing yourself to comfort. No one else can actually do that for you. It's physically, mentally, and spiritually impossible because the moment that you attempt to lean on something for that, you'll throw something else off balance. You must depend on yourself for that. And this is what we call self-sustainability. Uh, All is self these kind of terms. So what we have is, is we have lots of pointers. We have many examples. People are around us every single day just giving us examples in the way that they act out, what they say, what they do, whether it's, you name it, uh, Bill Nye, the science guy, or Nicki Minaj. The entire spectrum of beings are present, each living out their own lives, but also living a life for you, meaning letting you see these other frequencies and other wavelengths that do exist in you, meaning that you can get up there, you could, you know, philosophize, or you could get up there and you could twerk. I mean, either way, you can uh, choose to assess that frequency, but where is it going to get you on your path? 
This is the big, the big question. Where do you want to go? Because, see, this is a hyperdimensional vehicle that can take you anywhere. Nobody should be telling you this is where you should go. And this is where you have to go. That kind of stuff actually doesn't exist within this framework. And we're seeing it every day. What this is about is you taking full account of what you're experiencing and what's going on around you to determine where you want to go. So that's what it means to be a master of yourself, a lord of your life, or the master of this universe or universe, etc., because it's internal and external. And if you can't do it one way, you can for sure do it another, meaning that if somehow the external reality is presenting some kind of barrier, then there are techniques to go internally to remove that barrier. And likewise, if internally there's, being, there's something presented to where you cannot cross over into certain stages, then externally, uh, as an example, there may be a plant there that allows you to cross over into that stage, you see? So this is also the reason why we created this external and external realm. Because it allows us to continuously power our existence. Because you start to realize in internalism, everything is still, everything is quiet, while in externalism, everything is in motion. So one is movable and unmovable. And we find in our existence that just as we need the negative and the positive, just as we need the, the building and the destroying, that we need these two components in order to really drive our experience. So when we come forward, we're going to be talking a little bit more about this light. And then we're going to get deep into a few other things. And then I have quite a few questions to get through, which is going to really, really um, do some clarifying for a lot of people because we all tend to have the same questions. And, uh, and it's great that we just have a platform that those questions are being asked. with Robert Bruce Monday through Thursday on Truth Frequency Radio. So it starts running, and you know, and it starts getting faster and faster, and pretty soon nobody better jump in the way. So, you know, there's a little bit of conspiracy to this because, you know, the, again, the pretext of this then is just for you to realize that you are pure light, and it's actually you're out there still. But all of this Keymaker series has been talking about these walls and these schisms that have actually been set up that are somewhat stepping down our abilities. And so it's almost like it's simple to see as a water hose. And, you know, that water hose may be something like an umbilical cord where we have this connection to this source that is all there ever will be. And if someone squeezes that, that cable, then the amount of energy or essence that gets to us is actually stepped down. And so that's one way of, of explaining it, because from, from what I see, and not only spiritually, but also read in many of the books that still contain a great deal of the knowledge is that the existence of humanity in history is nothing like what the beings are existing like now. The level of power and manifestation is on an entirely different level. So I call it like, it's like the mini, the mini me's. 
And how this kind of works is, is that you could imagine that our ancestors were very vast and had a, a great deal of control over their consciousness, even in physicality. And this is why physicality has become somewhat of a, you know, uh, it's been demonized now. People hate physicality almost. They see it as, you know, like, oh, physicality, it's all an illusion. It's all been created. It's flat and blah, 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 blah. And then there'll be no end of stories that we will keep coming up with because there's a limitation in our physicality. Like if you want to go and do something right now, if you just decide, man, I need to go and really check out Stonehenge, you may have passport issues. You may have plane ticket issues. You're going to have all these issues that actually impede you from being able to just get up and go do whatever you want to do in physicality. And in the past, in, in ancient time, it didn't actually exist that way. So you could imagine if you were on a physical plane to where you can now conceive rather than incept. So the astral plane is really, it, it's, it's, it's into ideals. It's into uh, ethereal uh, projection in itself. It's like basically a, a land of ideas. But to live out those ideas and to actually animate those ideas, well, that's what physicality is for. So as each being being supreme, you would, in a certain sense, you had your own planet, and that's actually your, your body. So you, having your own body gives you access to this planet through your projector. And you know, just follow me with this here if it's getting a little complex. But through your own projector, it's like when you're going to sleep at night, you can actually end up in a real solid physical world in this state of consciousness that you're in. So the thing is, is that this is why it all starts to blur at a certain point. And it's because, well, if we don't have access to that now, it becomes almost unbelievable. And the only glimpse that we have of it is actually the dream world and deep dreaming to where you can actually be inside of a reality and pick dirt off the floor and smell things and, you know, get some, some joy, joy and incitement and even experience pain. And then you're in this reality that's, quote unquote, supposed to be a dream. So what I'm saying is, is that this physical reality that we're living in now, the one that we're waking up to, is we wake up on another side of the wall that doesn't give us access to all of our powers and abilities like you see of what you do in the dream. Now, in the dream, you have, quote unquote, a physical reality or as much as a physical reality really could be. But you also have this waking state that seems to cut you off from that. And that's akin to almost like the cutting of the mother's umbilical cord. So here's how that works. When I was looking at some imagery that was uh, put together by the Royal Society, and this is the, during the Enlightenment era, this is the time in which uh, royalty, a certain group of royals, in this case it was Great Britain, decided that they would have their advent at looking into spirituality since their culture is more of a cave culture. And, you know, I won't say that as a negative thing, though, because cave culture has a lot to do also with being close to the mother. In this case, the mother is earth, rock, crystal, stone, hard foundation, hard upbringing, solid upbringing. So, you know, there is a power within every single culture. But the ethereal side, which doesn't connect necessarily with the cave, was virtually uh, not present for this group or spectrum of people. So when they went throughout the world, they saw that other people were deeply immersed in these high ethereal states of consciousness. So once they got to a point of being able to invest their time and energy on a professional royal level into figuring out how all that spiritual stuff really worked, then they put their best minds on it. And that created what we know as 100 years ago, the Enlightenment era. And during the Enlightenment era, which you can Google, you will see different images come up, like such as Haeckel's work, um, Medellin's work. There's different people who were beginning to create. And because there was no TV, everything had to be illustrated. And what you see in some of these illustrations, uh, and I have some of those illustrations in the university course or some of those that have seen those illustrations, but it's basically using the lights to begin to create illusions. And this is much too complex of a topic for me not to dedicate an entire show to, but it basically involves overlaying. This is like when you can create as much of a dream as you what we dream, but it's overlaid with actual programming. So what 
happens is, is people don't actually perceive things the way that they actually are. And I'll give a little bit more background on this because, you know, that may be jumping too far ahead. But once the light is refracted, remember, once light is slowed down, it becomes more dense and then it becomes physical. OK, so if you can imagine that our ancestors, which is you, because <laughs> there's no separation, this is the new separation that's been connected. This is this is the new separation, excuse me, that's been created. And this separation detaches us from great grandma, great, great grandfather, great, 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 great. And all as far as you can go back, it puts a line in between each of those segments. And that's why they like they like to describe this as a tree. Because if you notice, the tree also has those separation points. It has those lines in the tree to, okay, well, the tree is now grown a whole, gone a whole nother cycle and it's older. And now, so it has a ring. And then that ring is the outer growth while a new ring is formed around that. Okay. So what this, what this is getting us to is, is that this separation that is created is actually what is stepping down our energy. And that's why they say, that generally the a woman's first children are the strongest children. And then as she continues to have children, those children get weaker and weaker and weaker. And so as the earth, the first beings that were here were of a certain magnitude. Some call them giants. But over the period of time of the continuous birthing from this womb, then it began to be less and less and less and less. And now you're dealing with mini man. So the real explanation behind that is, is that that's the refraction of the light. So whatever's causing it, because I started seeing this as, you know, just to get into some of the technical terms, it's like stereolithography. It's like using lasers to harden objects, uh, lasers projecting a specific image until the point where once that's gone into what we would call resin, in this case, the earth, then it's, it becomes hardened and then it becomes an, an image so that's why they say, well, you know, let us create man in our own image. We're not talking about some other beings attempting to actually create something that, because how could that even be possible? We, we, we're not created. We're unbegotten. What we're talking about is creating an ideal, slowing down the being, making the being think that they're not supreme, making the being think that they're not the universe. And this is the infection that's happening throughout the entire realm. Look at what's happening when you tell someone that they're a cosmos, they're still actually trying to attach on to some elder God or some book or and trying to make sense out of all that when truly we are a magnitude, we are very powerful beings, but we've been stepped down. And how that stepping down happens is on so many different levels, whether it's someone's refracting the light, that could be the moon, or whether it's someone psychologically programming you to believe that you're not who you really are. So in a sense, we're operating in slow motion. And this is what you begin to realize when you go into these stages it, through utilization of any vibrational frequency raising substance, be it air, breath, ayahuasca, whatever, is as your frequency starts speeding up, then you start to really see other things that are operating on other wavelengths. And when you get deeper into that study of wavelengths and frequencies, then you realize that the more rapid something is moving, the less you can actually see it. So all of the rapid moving beings, the things that are closer to the source, you can't actually see. Versus all the more denser an object gets, the further away it pulls itself from oscillation, the more it becomes visible. All the way down into the stone and even deeper than stones, right? So these are the vibratory frequencies and the wavelengths. So we're going to talk in this conversation, I'm just laying the foreground here, about how to come in and out of this phase, which also that's, that's called phasing, phasing in, phasing out. This is saying how to get out of this particular mindset, this phase that you're in, and how to speed up and get into a higher vibratory frequency to become more aware of what's really going on. So to to go into this a little bit deeper. So being this light, okay, now it makes our orbit or our path in this particular realm, 
our orbit or our path, like why you're here on earth, is because on your orbit, everyone has a different orbit. Some people live to 72. Some people live to 30. Some people live to 50. Some people live to, to 40 in a few months. That's your orbit. They call that your path. That's why people say, oh, you know, my path this lifetime. Okay, so that's the, your duration around this particular cell. So to me, when looking at that, it's highly possible then that a person could be repeating their path over and over and over and over and over again unless they somehow come out of that orbit. So this, this explains to us a lot about how this really works, how, how a cell or, or, or how uh, atoms and protons and all this form around the nucleus, et cetera, et cetera. Like when you just see those drawings, you don't have to know the science. Just look at those drawings. And then what those drawings begin to allow you to see is, oh my goodness, that's the orbits. That's the light. And when the light is stepped down, then it becomes physical. So there's also another term that's called recording, right? Because this is why I say it can repeat over and over and over again, because I found an uncanny similarity between what records are, which are basically solidified crystals, and then when you vibrate that layer, that magnetic layer, when you vibrate it, it plays the sound over again. And I know I can, I can even hear that this is, you know, it's beginning to be a little bit difficult to follow along with this, except for the ones who are, who are deep into this. But just bear with it, because during, during, as the conversation continues, it'll become more and more easier to understand what's going on. And I will say, it takes me quite a bit to meditate through this. Like some people think that this is all knowledge, you know, he's just talking knowledge. Now, no, I sit in at 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning and I meditate and I just ask small questions like, so how could it be that way? And then it's like, well, you know, it's, sa it's the same mechanics as this. There's nothing that has been created in the world that hasn't been a direct replication of what's going on on a spiritual level. And as we continue to go, and 2016 is really the mega year, as we go further and further into this quote-unquote technology, the closer and closer that they get to releasing certain forms of technology, it's actually getting closer and closer to letting people catch on to what's going on with what's happening on the spiritual plane. Because everything that's put into technology, it comes from the yours truly, meaning the actual beings that we are. The ears being the speaker, the antennas being the hair, the eyes being the camera, all of these different forms of this tech if, if some of the people that knew about it the most for one moment caught on that this was actually anything to do with their spiritual being, they will already know everything that was going on. So what's happening for us is, is that we're coming from these spiritual backgrounds and we're beginning to put two and two together. We're actually merging the worlds instead of saying, OK, well, you know, technology is, you know, the alien and, you know, it's foolishness and blah, blah, blah. Well, first of all, there's nothing new under the sun. Everything is just a replication of something else as above, so below. So what is the as above relationship between the human eye and the camera? There it is right there. So you take it one more level up, then it's a cosmos. You take it, you know, as they see the eye in the nebula, then you take it one more level up if you can go that far. So everything has that same kind of nature to it. And the more that we catch on to, wait, wait, this is what's really going on. That's why I say you can look at things like a record and say, well, wait a minute, what is a record really? It's crystal. It's a crystallized form. And then when you vibrate that crystal, it plays this sound or frequency. So could humans be somewhat of this on the same system to where during their orbit, which is the circumference of their record, that when they get vibrated and triggered, that they play out certain roles that they will continue to play out over and over and over again until they realize what's going on. Hence the term recording or to record, to put the cord, which is the twining, which is the coil, to coil it back up. And this is what they talk about. Well, the Kundalini is coiled up. And then when you have this awakening, it uncoils itself. And then, you know, I guess if you go back to sleep, it'll coil itself back up. Sometimes they use the term rebinding. This means that literally to be held back or to be held on or wound around something or binded to it and then to somehow try to come unraveled from it. So to get out of your same role, 
literally. Okay, so look at the words. This is my role. This is my path. That's the orbits. All this stuff can be taken literally. So the whole purpose then of true meditation is actually to learn to focus yourself back into the light of yourself, like a laser point, meaning that the accuracy of a laser is what we're actually dealing with, with who you are beyond all of this physicality. And the purpose of meditation is to, to guide yourself back into that point so that you can be all powerful and all focused and then fire your beam. See, I'm not saying to just get back to the laser point and chill there because you'll find just like most that think that everything is only internal, that there is something more, that this will never end. Look at even the the forte or the storyline of who God is, that God as the monad then breathes out and then he creates all the worlds and then he breathes in. Now, I don't go for those kind of stories, especially when there's a male character or a he attached to it. But what I'm saying is look at the underlying story here, that there's a breathing in and there's a breathing out. So there's a creation and a manifestation, and then there's a nihilism in a a point to where there's there's nothing, okay? So this means that the laser point is the point of nothing. That's when you experience everything, right? Everyone knows that. You know, they, they talk about, you know, it's unfathomable, the energy levels of what we're talking about beyond all of this. Right. So in your when you're in the laser point, you're just you're in the eye of the storm. I was in the eye of the storm the other night. I mean, it's just it's incredible. Like you don't even want to try to put the mind around it or any uh, of the mechanics that we use on the planet around it or just strip it. It'll strip it right off because it can't even be confined into the ideal of what is that. Right. So that's the laser point. But a being that is moving with purpose and that has purpose then takes that energy from that point and then fires it. Just like you see when they say that the light or the electron, which is what male, the male is, the L, the penis, basically, is fired into it. That he delivers a spark. And then that spark goes into that egg and then it creates life. Just like they say, well, if we let off a spark in the water, even on just a basic level, this is the as below version. If we let off spark inside of a water, a single cell life form will appear from nowhere and start the beginning of the process of what they call evolution. So it's all the same thing. All the knowledge is right there for us. And it has a spiritual and a physical nature to it. It doesn't have just one or the other. And then the, the, the one that's in the middle is actually the mind because the mind is responsible for making heads or tails of it, literally. So in conclusion of this first part, it's clear by this research from NASA that frequencies do affect, especially certain frequencies, can affect and rearrange or even pull apart DNA. So what that means is, is that there's a point to where if we're immersed completely in frequency, then we actually have a situation to where we can become less and less conscious of who we are. Unless we're making a true intention at every single moment to be in that stage of meditation. As they say, meditation is not something that you just sit down and do and then get up and then go do something else. It's actually a state of mind. It's a way of being. So staying in that meditation, meditative mind actually keeps us from being absorbed into frequencies that throw off our consciousness and actually pull apart our DNA or our connection with our ancestors. So that's that part. And I'm glad that we got that. We got about five more minutes into this and um, into this particular segment. So I'll keep going. So it's also safe to say that many beings here, if not all the beings, I actually, you know, you can encompass it as that, all the beings are on a great magnitude. But they're intentionally being departicalized and delocalized. Okay, that's what frequencies can do, like 60 hertz and 100 hertz. There's different frequencies that delocalize a person. So this is why you could see a person, it's kind of like they're just abstract. They're just distracted. It's like they're not exactly there, but they're here. 
And this is because that departicalization that goes on that happens within the consciousness if we're not constantly aware. So what I was able to de dig deep into was once figuring out my origins in a certain tense, like, okay, so now I get it. So now I understand, you know, why I'm not in conflict up there and why conflict doesn't exist up there. But it, it does exist, but it's called something totally different. It's actually called merging. And then on here on the physical plane, that same merging is looked at as conflict and even looked at as consumption because I wanted to know why is eating such a major component on the dimension? I mean, every single thing just about consumes something, whether it's bird or fish, you know, always putting something in the mouth or inside of the body. And then now it has it inside of the body. Well, that's the light joining. So you do as a sentient life form, you can, I'll say, you can be conscious of what kind of lights that you cohabit with. And that alone in itself gives you a major power. And this is why I believe that the powers that we have are not as defined as throwing lightning and things from the hand, but as simple as watching the intake that we put inside of our body and what kind of lights that we're actually blending with, because that's going to actually determine everything. And then the height of this knowledge to me was that since there are so many stars in the sky, and that can definitely account for how many life forms that are here, especially when you look deeper into the zodiacal energies and what creates those energies, then it kind of leads to that the sun has this same thing going on. That the actual, what we see as a physical sun in the sky actually at some point had to be stepped down, the light refracted, and then it, in, it itself incarnated into a physical form. And I think that this is what you're dealing with with the old ancient kings, or aka the sun king, the king of kings. This would be in a certain tense where they learned all the king stuff from because there had to be some kind of original uh, physical manifestation of the sun that actually be, uh, became stepped down over a prolonged period of time just like we are. And it's not saying be that one... It, excuse me. This is also how you get the difference in people's status. And I'm not saying so much as now because now it's all being tampered with. But before, if a star, let's say, is further out and not as close to this physical plane or this particular cell, then it may appear as just a beetle here versus if it's super close then it may actually appear as some kind of king. And if this, you know, it's tossing it around a bit, but it's very plausible because when you start understanding the refraction of light and the distance of light in the orbits, that actually is what creates whether a person is, quote unquote, all powerful on the dimension or minuscule. And then on top of that, what does really become the controlling integer is actually us. And this is where the power is back into your hands because you can still determine right now if you go on to this high rapid frequency based on your actions and activities and what you do with your body, your mind and soul, or if you stay in this lowly state so far from yourself. OK, because when we're to, when we say getting closer to the source, if you are the source, this means getting closer to yourself. So as a distant star, if you draw down your own light, then you can make yourself closer than even the sun is. And these are the concepts that lay the ground, broader than concepts, but they lay the ground to how one can become all-seeing, all-knowing, and all-powerful on this plane and beyond. So we're going to go into another break here, and then when we come forward, we're going to be um, getting into the questions and there's a, just a few more things that I have to elaborate on in regards to this, mainly one more thing, and then the questions actually reveal a great deal. So I'll see you in just a moment. This is the Truth Frequency Radio Network. We are TFR. Truth Frequency Radio.
okay and we're forward and we're going into the final hour so you know how we say you know we have to finish strong so you know the last thing i wanted to say about the topic in itself because you know i may, I may have to revisit it but i mean it's very plausible like i have to I, I've been into um, some different aspects of, of our existence and it all makes sense. And it doesn't make sense just from a mental level. Like when you go into the meditations and you go deep in and within yourself, you actually begin to see all this. But it doesn't come in English. So when you're trying to interpret, well, what exactly am I experiencing and, and how can I relate this to what others are experiencing in the reality since that's, that's what I do, then you have to come up with parables and metaphors in order to connect people with understanding what's exactly going on within themselves. Because remember, one of the biggest things that a lot of people ask a lot about is, well, why is another person uh, on this physical plane supposedly uh, greater than me? Like, why do they have more than me? And beside the all out cheating, what I'm saying is, is that people who have drawn their soul force closer to themselves, and this is just being aware of certain kind of knowledge, which we know that knowledge is, is circulating around many of these uh, supposed secret societies. But this knowledge, NASA is a secret society. I mean, there's knowledge about frequency and just pages and pages and pages and pages of knowledge about frequency and what frequency does. But yet we don't actually like if I say, well, you know, what specific frequency can I use to do something about this? And how many wavelengths do I, what wavelength do I need to put it, put it at? And what kind of transmitter or carrier do I need to use? You know, all that becomes so fuzzy for us. And this, to me, it, it does really account for why we have so little real control over ourselves. Not so much as others, but mainly also control over ourselves so others cannot attempt to control us. That they can't actually even phase into where we're at. So all I'm doing is, and I've been doing it for years, is sharing what I'm experiencing and, and what goes on in my daily life. And I'm just doing the best that I can at that. But it does get to a point to where, you know, it's just like you can, you can have so much of this knowledge and then so much application. And you're just looking for an intense more outlets and variations of how to put all that together. So, you know, next year also is going to be yet another massive year for, for me personally to, to keep applying this knowledge um, and experience into more than just conversations, but also inventions and things that are going to be created. So just remember that the highest level of, you know, if we want to do the highest and lowest thing, the highest level of spiritual knowledge is actually the most connected level of spiritual knowledge. Meaning that if you can't get the connection, if, if the Ouroboros, if you don't see it, like if the, if it, the end doesn't meet the beginning, if the above doesn't meet the below, then that's a poor level of spiritual knowledge and comprehension. And that's why, to me personally, the, the religions have done an extreme injustice to our consciousness because it doesn't, most religions don't incorporate things like diet. You know, even many of these religions still endorse just eating meat. You know, I'm not going to go into the what's right or wrong to do, but you don't, you find in the Bible, they got the kosher diet and everything, but it does still say you could just consume all these animals, the same thing in Islam. So what I'm saying is, is that many of these systems are not all encompassing. So to me, they're inferior, but the, because the, the supreme system of knowledge has connected everything, even if we don't want to accept that, oh, okay, well, this is because the sun has been uh, refracted, but still maintains its physical um, consciousness on the dimension, then we will have things like kings and just as distorted as we have been from our original aspect of who we are in this existence, so too will that being. And then what you'll get from that being is that megalomania maniac externalized i'm in control of everything because it will resonate on that frequency until it comes into that total realization that oh man i must be that and i believe that our ancestors are already aware of that they were like well yeah i mean they they went under terms as solar beings and and those of the light etc so I'm going to go into questions here. And the first question actually, I believe, may have been the last question that we finished off with last week. But I wanted to make sure that we did cover that question, if not. And it was Anthony Gilmore's question. And he says that he's always had these strange powers with being able to see colors like rainbows in the darkness. And if we could, uh, he asked, how can he help to prep himself for what is coming? 
And my response to that was defining what is coming in is the definition of our departure from physicality, meaning that if, if someone's wondering, well, what am I, you know, trying to prepare for this wars and all these different kind of things, you're just wasting your time. The only thing that you should be preparing for is a departure from so-called illusionary physical plane. And it ties right into what, in this case of Gilmore's power, is to be able to see these lights within his own consciousness. And because we're very dependent on that external light. Now, remember, the external light's true manifestation in a certain tense becomes the sun, and then its refraction becomes the king. So in this world, we are heavily dependent on this king. We're heavily dependent on these leaders, the presidents and their money and all the systems that they put together. So it ties in. It all connects. That's what I was saying. It, it, in the blueprint, it'll all connect. And so what you'll find is, is that when you begin to generate your own light, and that's why in sovereignty, you get words that actually tie into being able to generate your own light. And so when you have that, even from just a basic level, this is another, again, as above, so below connection. When you can power your own house, that's power. <laughs> you know, if you can, if your lights and your, your gas and all that's coming on by leave of either your inventions or something that you've implemented on your property that generates that energy and that current and power for you, then you're closer to sovereignty. That's, there are real sovereigns. There are people that have passports, especially, you know, there's uh, South African passports from Dutch people. They say sovereign because those people actually supply all of their own resources to themselves. So there is actually a physical version of a sovereign. So sometimes we don't have to go too far off into our explanations and definitions of what things really are because of this connection that the blueprint shows us. So where these power, these forces that say they're in power, even pretend to be gods in a tense. Well, I can't say pretend because we all are supreme beings. So that's the whole forked tongue of it, meaning that if everyone's a supreme being and one is acting out and saying, well, I am the supreme being, I'm God, but you believe that you're not, there's still no lies that have actually crossed over there except for the lie that you're not. So these are the big connections that we have to make. So true power, uh, these beings or, or humans, we're all beings, have accomplished their power within providing electricities, gases. These are also powers. Okay, that's why I say the elements, magician works with elements, right? Those elements are power. The elements are gaseous. The elements are electricity. So these same elements are present. So it's not so hocus pocus as we may think. So I'll go on to the next question. And so, to, excuse me, the conclusion of that question is to continuously work on generating your own light. And I think that that was the end of last, the last show was that when you do start to get your breathing together and your focus together and you actually close your eyes, you can begin to see that your frontal lobe and the same equipment that you use to dream with does project light. And when you have that, even in death, you will not die because death is, quote unquote, darkness. But in that phase and in that period, you will have your own light. So that's how that works. So uh, J. J. Rowe asked in episode zero, it had been mentioned that Robert, Mon Robert Monroe's work had been altered and they asked about um, that they're, they said that they're using the hemisync uh, materials and they would like to know how they have been altered. And what I'll say is, is that in Dr. Monroe's journals himself, that what he mentioned was, is that towards the final days of the Institute, that the government had moved in because they had become extremely curious about this whole prospect of remote viewing in order to use for many of the things that they get involved in. And the, that oversight was so heavy that there was someone that worked for the government there at every single moment monitoring everything that was going wrong, I mean, going on. And um, so the big question is, because I've actually seen, I, I've actually had access to even some of the older hemi-sync materials, but the big question is how successful that you've been with the program, meaning all the CDs and the proper headphones, et cetera, because after me using it for a month, I found that simple lucid dream techniques available on the internet produce better results than Dr. Monroe's, 
you know, 12, 30 CD set. So I guess that's a question again that you have to put back on yourself and say, well, how much are you progressing with being able to make those uh, trips from, uh, from the uh, Dr. Monroe material? Uh, the same person, J-Roll, goes on and continues to ask, how do you locate uh, your personal reincarnation timeline? Okay, and... Okay, I was just making sure I'm still connected and live here. Okay, so the person asks, <laughs> how they, <laughs> you never know what these systems, but you know, how do you basically re- re- you locate your personal reincarnation timeline? And I, I, I explain that for a being that is the cosmos, because we've gone over this before, that we're in fact everything, no matter how much we want to accept that or deny that. So it's really more about what point do we want to determine what is ours if we're every frequency. So it's like, if you're trying to find your own in that word, you're going to basically then say and program yourself to say, well, this is what I'll take responsibility for. This is what's mine. So what we witness is people acting out different combinations of frequencies, not so much as them being something different. And I don't know if that um, makes sense or not to most people, but what I'm saying is it's just like a piano. If we hit the A, it's always going to sound the same. And if we hit the B, it's always going to sound the same. But if we hit them in different combinations, now those different combinations may be different, but these are the same tones. So that's what it's like to determine where our personal reincarnation timeline is, is to find the exact same tone that we play during the exact same point and then to follow that tone or song along for an infinite period, which, you know, at a certain point, you have to wonder, well, what would the use of something like that really be? So it's really about finding yourself now, like understanding who you are now and what you want to be and what you want to do and get ready for that level of projection and manifestation. And then understand the frequencies, the tones and the vibrations that you're going to need to admit that correspond to that. The next question here actually is by Mary uh, Hurd. And she asked, do I have any input on the uh, phrase being chanted, Nama Yo Renge Q, which is actually um, a mantra? And let me see, because I actually had answered this question in greater detail. So I want to make sure that it's actually in the timeline here, or if it was a part of the last week's questions, but it is. Okay. So my explanation to that is okay, so first of all, we have to rewind here. And of course, this has all been talked about before, but. Uh, I have no problem with going over it again. So what are mantras anyway, and how do they work? Okay, so I'll answer that question first. So what mantras are, are tones or vibrations in specific sequences that cause various outcomes. And the reason why is because generally those tones and vibrations, just like each frequency does a different thing, that someone has configured those tones and vibrations to cause a certain response. And that throughout history, sometimes thousands, if not millions of years into what we're calling the past, even though sound transcends time at a certain point, because that's why they call it like the golden ring of Buddha. And this is supposedly a ring of, of people who have joined Buddhism over thousands, if not millions of years. Okay? And this is because as human beings, just like what the DNA is doing, that we actually make a bridge or a connection with our echoes. So since everyone's emitting a frequency, we're echoing across time. And it's connecting from the beginning of what we call time to the end of what we're calling time, which is actually stretching out in some level of being infinite. So what mantras are, are there's people a thousand years ago still saying those mantras right now, since there's no such thing as time. And when you say those mantras, then then you connect with those people across time. And then the overall outcome or effect of that mantra, you begin to possess. So if other people use it for specific purposes continually, then they program that mantra for that purpose and intention. And that's what mantras are. Now, personally, because many of these mantras are in languages that are yet to be completely deciphered or haven't been deciphered or have been deciphered in a Western way, I don't advise a person to just go right into trying combinations of mantras because mantras are real. They do work. 
frequency, tone, vibration does work. So because some of the mantras, a large percentage of them actually within this modern culture have been configured to actually cause some level of possession, it's something that you really need to really look deeper into. And that's why intonation is also known, which is basically being able to intone the mantra inside of your consciousness because that actually keeps it contained versus when you're evoking, which is basically saying the mantra externally, then you're going to bring it into an external world. And things that have a great deal of power generally don't respond very well when being confined back into physical realities for obvious reasons. So that's adept level stuff, but something that you really should know about not mantras, evocation, and intonings. So the next question uh, from Imhotep Min Mayat Ray, he asked, are, or, yeah, he asked, are there possible metaphysical reasons for early on progressive bone cracking, both voluntary and non-voluntary? What I'll say is, is that there's actually no need to look at such things from a metaphysical level. That metaphysical would be transcending into a level that, you know, it's a little bit higher than what you need to look into to understand what's going on. When the bones begin to crack and there's a lot of cracking going on, this is generally deterioration within the ligament and the cartridge, cartilage. And then also a lot of gas accumulation, because that's actually what the popping sound is, is gas accumulation within those bones. So simply upping the magnesium intake and mineralizing the body to a better level will address this issue and will allow the cartilage and things to form themselves properly. And that will stop a lot of the bone cracking, et cetera, which you experience and see people experience, especially when they're getting older. Zachary Bryant asks a question and he says he's heard me speak on going into the jungle and he says that he utilizes nature to reflect his current state. And then what are some of the what are some of the tools or knowledge that I use when I go on those trips that allow me to sustain myself as a vegetarian? And although I couldn't really connect the context of the questions uh, asked in relation to the vegetarian versus being out in the jungle, what I will say is once you become a vegetarian for a prolonged period, it's easy to see the benefits, especially if you're doing it properly. Um, So we discussed this quite a few different times about having a complete protein on hand. This is, of course, hemp, pea protein, and brown rice. When mixing them together, make a complete protein. That's hemp, pea, and brown rice. And you would be surprised that many of the top vegetarian proteins out there actually are not complete. And what that causes is an overall deterioration of the system, which leads to loss of immunity, loss of strength, etc. In addition, you do need to supplement your diet with creatine because that's actually the only thing that you're getting from the meat. And there are natural forms of creatine. And then lastly, if you're actually doing a lot of physical training, then you want to get on to a good amino acid, especially, you know, to recover, such as myothon, and you'll see wonders in your training. And I'm actually, I got Dave coming in in a couple weeks, I believe, and we're going to get on this really heavy. So I'm going to be broadcasting uh, a lot of videos about us just in there, you know, working out and getting to it so people can see that it's definitely not um, about that if you eat vegetables only, then you can't get to a certain level of strength, et cetera. You know, all that is a lot of falsehood. But it is true that if you don't have a complete protein and you don't supplement with creatine, because I went through at least two to three years like that of my life, and it was very torrential, and that's just the lack of knowledge. And that's why I say, you know, by the lack of knowledge, they perish. So if you don't have that knowledge about your body, see, because your body is you, that's your creation, you're responsible for that. So this neglect sometimes that people have like, oh, you know, no, I don't need to I don't need to be concerned with any of that. I just need to keep my meditation. My meditation will show me everything like this is, again, that same haphazard way of being 
that, you know, it doesn't, you know, you can't do that for 20, 30 years. You can't do it for even five, 10 years without snapping into real debt put and saying, well, no, let me understand more about this body and how I can get it running into premium condition because it's not about neglecting the body just because you become spiritual. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. And then it's also not about, you know, letting go of the mind completely. It's not about any of that beside keeping it all in balance and put into its proper place. Um, so the next question is, is Zachary asks, when it comes to the point of facing myself and accepting myself, I feel like I don't need to eat because it brings me out of the experience. Is this a matter of my personal use of food or is it in, or is it in that acceptance a different type of consumption perhaps? So basically what he's saying is, is that is it in his, his type of consumption or is it in his uh, perception of food? And, you know, I think I'm kind of, you know, some of these questions, they come through and they got a little syntax. So I try to read them out and, and, you know, get them into the proper syntax as much as possible. But in truth, the body is in union with the mind and the soul. Like this continuous separateness that we're, we're up to these days, you know, I'm starting to see it as more dangerous than anything. And it's highly plausible of why many people are doing it, because if you spin and I talk about this later on, but if you spin a lot of time, let's say your first 20 years in life external, and then all of a sudden you hear about this internalism, you hear about this meditation, the slingshot effect is that you will try to spend the next 20 years internal. When either way, since the beginning, we should have been in balance. That's why the, the, the knowledge of our ancestors talked about mental, spiritual, physical growth. It didn't talk about just spiritual growth. So we've gained this perception from many of these new age movements that through the spiritual mind that everything can be done. And even though a great deal of things, even beyond our limits in physicality can be done, the three are to work, if we're gonna use that mind, body, and soul, the three are to really work in harmony because you're present on all three planes. You're on the mental plane. People can mentally affect you. It's the, the physical plane, people can physically affect you. And the spiritual plane, people can physically, spiritually affect you. So you're challenged in attempts to actually remain fully strengthened on all of those planes. And that becomes the gauntlet. So the, I say again, so the truth, the body is in union with the mind and the soul. If we tap more into any of those fields, they will reduce our desire to cater to the other fields. And I had a situation like this that I'll explain briefly where, you know, I had one on this, I think it was a three-year stint of just only spirituality. And it was a part of that slingshot effect. So I'm only speaking about this through experience. And in, within that last year, and mainly within that last six months of that three years, I started experiencing extreme breakdown within the body, the immunity. I had lost some weight. You know, if someone even sneezed, I would catch their cold. But how fast I can get my frequency onto another level and, and, and basically transcend from the body was almost at the snap of a finger. But I was still having this problem in the physical reality. So it had gotten so bad that my bones had felt like they had demagnetized. That was the only way that I can explain it. I had, was in one of those fringe experiments of mine, and I had slept on this whole bed of magnetite. And don't do that because the poles on the magnets, you need to understand where those poles are going. But I didn't know anything about that. So I had them all under my pillow. And then when I woke up in the morning, it was like my bones wouldn't actually lock in together. Like even when walking, it felt like, you know, that they were coming apart. So I just so happened to have a friend that was over and she started a, a, a Kundalini class or something. And this teacher from the East was there and she said, well, you know, maybe you should go and see him. So, you know, I got myself together and went to see him. And when he was done with the class and then he said, well, you know, I, let me see what I can do for you. Let me test your energy. So he did a couple things that, you know, these uh, uh, kind of men know to do. And then he said, man, your mean energy is way too high. And of course, you know, for Westerners, we know it as energy. For the people who practice this, there's mean, there's jing, there's different kind of energies that correspond to different things. So what he was saying was, is that my spiritual energy was so high, it was killing my body. Because the signal that I had been sending to my body was I'm ready to ascend. I'm ready to ascend. I'm done with the planet. I'm done with the physical plane. And when getting that signal on a continuous basis, you will actually start to lose your physical body. And now we're all here to do something. You know, I'm sure that the world wouldn't have been um, a better place 
if I had a left, let's just say it like that. But let's just be truthful here. We do have something to do. So it's about us remaining mentally, spiritually, physically strong. So if we're feeding one of these bodies, one of these states of our consciousness too much, it will attempt to overthrow the other because it's putting us out of balance. So this is the main thing is that we speak on balance and many are struggling with the concept of understanding what that is, but it's very important not to neglect any part of the creation, such as children. Each aspect of ourself is our responsibility. So it's our responsibility, our mind, body, and soul, because it's what we're endowed with. So when we come forward, we have one more uh, half or quarter of the conversation. I have a little bit more to go with the questions, some very interesting stuff to be answered. And then we'll get through that and then uh, and then we'll uh, we'll do it. Okay, and here we are again. And, you know, I'm super excited. I just, I feel so, I don't know, I just feel like I, I, I can do, well, I know I can do so much. And it's just like this whole talking thing is, is, it always gets to me. But, you know, I'm okay. I just, I just feel like explosive. Like I just, you know, I need to be out physically somewhere. But, you know, it's, it's cool to, to be on the line and to be transmitting with everyone. But, you know, I look forward to the day that we can all get together in person because it's just so much different. And me personally, I'm actually like a real people person. Like I, I tend to um, be a lot more pronounced when I'm around people and, and I can get things done. And um, so I'm looking to let 2016 manifest that. But it's been uh, quite a road because everything you want to do, you know, it, it takes some cash. It takes some resources. So I've had to become very um, innovative at, you know, how I can, you know, keep growing something like this because it doesn't actually appeal to many people for different reasons. And the listeners, yes, but just people who are who may be able to assist or to help, you know, there's always one thing or another, like either it's their Jesus or, you know, maybe you, you did you should have been pro black or, you know, whatever the case, it's always something. So what you find yourself doing is, you know, you find yourself doing it. So but when we're all together physically and then we can start to feel each other's energy more, then I, I understand that there's going to be a massive explosion so or implosion, as I should say. I should, you know, so I'm definitely looking forward to that. So to the next question. So Greg Whitaker asks, what is my take on using a float tank or deprivation tank for deeper spiritual work like John Lilly was reported to do? Of course, I love John Lilly's work. You know, one of the first people to communicate with dolphins and those books are actually available. John Lilly is no longer with us, but all of his works are available and, and they're actually free. Like I pulled down a massive John Lilly torrent one time and it con uh, contained all of his work. So um, the statement was you can't tell where your body ends and the water begins. The, t the tank consists of 800 pounds of Epsom salt, which is magnesium and 200 gallons of water at 93 degrees, and the tank is placed in total darkness with no sound. And so the answer to that question is to, for us always to remember that the poison is also the cure. It's, also, it's always about the alchemist or the one putting the formula together, because we just talked about earlier how you know, getting the senses off balance could cause some situations. However, in the case of the deprivation tank, what we'll be surprised to see is how when there's no gravity, the effects on our consciousness and zero G 
or anything close to it, it really makes the system akin to experiencing no resistance, especially in relation to the organs and the chakras. So believe it or not, you know, even just sitting down, there's a lot of weight on the back, the spine and on the organs. Likewise, even laying down because the gravity, you know, is always going to push and then activate certain muscles that we have just to stabilize ourselves. So when you get yourself into one of these deprivation tanks, you find that, you know, you get into this whole different state of consciousness because you truly dull any of the senses completely. Mainly that, well, actually I say when you, when you dull any of the senses completely allows us to focus more onto other senses. So you can experience this even if you don't have a deprivation tank by just getting some earplugs. I always tell people, go get some of those earplugs, the soft ones, stuff them in your ear and go to sleep and watch how things change with your dream world, how peaceful the body is when you wake up because you'd be surprised how many vibrations and sounds go on during the night that disturb you from different levels of your sleep, even the frequency. So when you get those earplugs in, you get a chance to experience a whole different level of quietness within your body, especially when you do that for a prolonged period of time, like eight hours, six hours, five hours, whatever. So also I talk about the, the more physical, the more physical senses that you shut down, the higher our spiritual perception becomes. So when you turn off the sound and the light and then the gravity, then this, you get this higher spiritual perception because the body doesn't need to send any kind of energy into those, um, how can I say, you know, in, into those outlets or into those uh, those parts of your consciousness. So and also magnesium is a great conductor, a great part of the body consists on the magnesium system. And in fact, that's one of the main things that we're going to be rolling out. Hopefully by the end of this year is I have an amazing blend of magnesium and zeolite that I'm working with that is proved to not only reduce uh, tissue, but also increase absorption of minerals. But, you know, that's something that, that I've been working on and it's finally coming to completion. But Magnesium is a great conductor. So when you're laying in that magnesium, every time the body pulses, which you get familiar with in meditation, then it reverberates and it actually sends it back into the body rather rapidly. So thumbs up on the deprivation tank. Obviously, it's a quite extensive setup, but some people, especially if you're in the U.S., you can actually find uh, places that rent these tanks. So, you know, definitely uh, something to check out. So Christoph uh, Berdorf asks, how do I work on my aura from a physical level beyond Taoist methods, meditations, et cetera? So the first thing I wanted to do, you know, just to get things clear really briefly here to, is to define the aura. Like what is the aura? Okay. And the aura is, of course, the light spectrum of our physical and mental existence conveyed via frequency. And the reason why I say it's physical, mental, and some, you know, you can incorporate it definitely into spiritual because even the term aura itself actually connects right into the spiritual. But it does consist of our physical and mental existence because you can physically raise the color of your aura. Like even if you go take a jog outside and then, you know, you've worked yourself up, there's a lot more current and vibration running through the body. And this increases the profoundness of the aura. Same thing also with the mental is many people always say, you know, we'll visualize this uh, white light. And that's generally done through the mind. The mind tries to visualize this light and then they can feel their frequency picking up. You can even think of raising your frequency if you can hear it in your ear and you think of it and you can even raise it. So this again shows us that there is a connection between the mind, body and soul Despite, you know, we live in the mind, body and soul every day, many keep trying to separate these three, but they are very much connected. So the higher current or vibration that we generate, the more vivid and defined the aura becomes. And I've seen that on different levels, you know, even when somebody takes one of those uh, aura raising, vibratory raising substances, you can see their aura actually get much more profound. So the aura has various colors because there's different parts of the chakra system and those different parts of the chakra systems have different orbits, thus different vibratory speeds. And we talked about this the last um, show, but just to, to understand, this is not anything fanciful. It's just like a lighter. You see the lighter has a blue, it has a red, and that's all based on the vibratory frequency of the burn off of the fuel. So it's the same thing with the body. The root chakra has generally that red color. The lower chakras have that brown color. You know, the crown chakra has that indigo or violet color. And it's because the actual orbits and the vibration of that particular chakra becomes more finer. So it's almost like a pulley system. 
So this is, and then, so you have the vibratory frequency and then you have when the vibratory frequency is amplified, then the colors become more vivid. And then also when the, when the vibratory frequency is very dense or very slow, it's almost undefined. And then also if a person is uh, only working with maybe one chakra, then you see that they're only defined by that one color of that chakra. So anyone who can really see into these chakras can really tell so much about a person, much more than anything that you would ever get from talking to them or uh, anything of that nature. You would get way more in just looking at the aura, looking at the colors on the aura because you could see what's developed, what's underdeveloped, what kind of energy system the person's working with. I mean, a plethora of data by just examining the person's aura. Um, With that being said, since the organs are attached to the uh, chakras and the vibratory fields of the body, cleaning them, since he asked, you know, what are the physical levels of, that you can do to increase your aura, cleaning them will, re- will reduce um, the, cl- you know, it, 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 <laughs> sorry, I just, I'm, getting, I'm, I'm all hyped up and then I'm having to go through some of this, this text, but cleaning them will uh, actually produce vivid results to your aura. So this means that if you do internal cleansing, if you do even colon cleansing, you allow the, sh- the chakra or the organ itself to vibrate at a higher frequency. So that increases the aura. So you can use either the complete internal cleansing. There's cleanse methods on the internet, such as the kidney cleanses, et cetera. And then this gives you a, st- and then with the internal cleansing kit, it gives you a step-by-step process of how to clean it. And then also just if you want to go right in and see, hey, does this even really work? You definitely want to go for a colon cleanse at least because that's one of the major chakras of the body. And that's the one that generally powers the rest of the chakras. So the next question is, is that I know you talk a lot about frequencies. What is your opinion on frequency vibratory medicine using quantum feedback and bioresonance to send healing frequencies to realign the body and in turn someone's health? What about the core energetics machine? So uh, personally, I've demoed out quite a few of the bioresonance machines, especially in my advent at the Institute here in Costa Rica. Um, there was a plethora of machines, even some of them that run into the thirty, forty thousand dollar $40,000 range. And it was quite clear to me that they do do something. Um, what I found was is that the software, though, it tended uh, tend to be the part of what was the most stagnant. And it's because there seems to be still only a little knowledge available, especially even by the creators of some of these machines, of what exactly these frequencies do and how they should be applied. Applied, Like, what is the gate? You know, there's how many times that you open the gate of the frequency and the herd sine wave versus square wave. So that, you know, frequency is not just frequency. You know, there's different, modula- there's different modulations. And I think that that's why frequency becomes such a broad topic for us because, you know, there's frequency that comes out of your radio, but there's also frequencies that are, um, that you can't see. And, you know, and there, so there's different kind of frequencies, microwave frequencies, et cetera. So me personally, um, I, so I think that the software, a lot of the software is still in beta, but what I found was the most effective part of these devices was a grid based antenna system that generally if you pulled apart in these bioresonance feedback pads or whatever, that they had an antenna that actually was meshed into generally some kind of plastic work. But just because of that, that antenna was very effective at interfacing with the body. So again, there's quite a bit of research on the frequency on frequencies out there. And I'm just beginning to delve into a lot of what goes on with dosimetry. Um, that's D O S I M E T R Y. If anyone wanted to check it out and then the bioelectro magnets, which is of course seeing how the body reacts to the bioelectric system and bioelectric magnetic system, which again, NASA has done a lot of research on because of needing to understand how frequencies affect people, especially in space. Uh, and in conclusion of that, uh, for the person that asked that question, I did also go to the core energetic site and unfortunately it was down. So I wasn't able to verify the kind of tech that they were using. Um, the next question by Patrick Samuels is asking, is the purpose of secret energy to break free of the reincarnation process and become a soul sovereign or, and does the course, which he's speaking of the university course, does that prepare students specifically for this? And what I'll say is that the purpose of secret energy is vast. 
It caters to neophytes and adepts alike. This has been six years, almost seven years now of knowledge and really not repeating the same thing too many times, but always coming into major breakthroughs as we do every show. Um, so I would say the core of our work, though, is sovereignty because we've taught people since the beginning how to get rid of these external ideas of a God and to begin to understand which is, you know, the term it says for, says everything, uh, to begin to understand that more about your multidimensional self. So the course itself at the university is a methodical introduction to every aspect of how to achieve that. It was a time in which I've taken the top topics itself of what I feel like encompasses total awakening and then putting it into some kind of order and introducing that. And many people have been elated about the information that's there and it's been more than fulfilling. The next question is, is why does the construct have a reincarnation process like this? And what is even the point? Is this something we should be weary about entering just after death is the purpose for, or is the purpose for greater good? And the answer to that question is I suggest that you check, check out uh, the thorough part of the Keymaker series, even going back to the beginning and then coming back to episode number five, because I really get into the whole reincarnation thing and what it's about in greater depth than I've really seen anyone cover. So we even get into uh, professional reincarnation. So definitely check out those previous episodes. OK, so the next thing is, is that T says, and I'm just using that. T because it is a somewhat of a personal question. So I didn't want to say the person's name, even though they said that I could. But uh, T, you know who you are. They ask, uh, I'll say it verbatim what they ask. T says, I just had a question regarding toxic, toxic relationships. I'm currently in an intimate relationship three years now with someone who's very spiritually asleep and in which I'm constantly engaging in arguments, fights, and constant negative energy. However, when we are not being bogged down by this energy, I feel a deep connection to this person that my heart simply cannot let go of. And although I'm experience, I'm ex I've experienced love before, I've never felt quite as connected. It's very intense, and it's making it difficult for me to make clear-headed decisions. As a result, at times I feel weak and at the whim of this person. And I was wondering if you could give any advice of exactly what this type of relationship is. Both of our highs and lows are incredibly intense. And I was wondering how you can actively break those sort of cycles in relationships and begin to achieve mutual growth, particularly where the person you're with has had a history of trauma, abuse, and are spiritually cut off, but with a very powerful energy nonetheless. And I thank you for the syntax of that because it allows me to actually read it straight through. Um, so the first answer to that is, as we discussed in, in previously um, in other questions, that there is other aspects to our being than just physicality, so, such as mentally and spiritually. So if at all those aspects are not kept in the balance, there will be extreme off balances, which, we can, which can, be like the warp, it can be like a warped wheel or warped chakra. So relationships are, are the most difficult for us to make drastic, drastic decisions in because we can become very complacent in those relationships. In fact, overall, we're very complacent beings. We would rather um, leave things the way that they are than to rock the boat and cause any kind of major changes. This is also why people stick to religious structures and you know stick to just dealing with whatever is going on in their life versus trying to, like I said, rock the boat and change things because it will make things drastically not only it will not only make things drastically change but there will be a period of time before the person can rebound and then actually find themselves into a comfortable position again so we kind of like fear that in many tenses so that is what keeps us into these relationships so what i say is it's only when we desire total liberty and the, and value it over anything else can we make decisions in life that are long overdue because we have these pending situations, and this is not even just in relationships. It can come in, in many different shapes and forms. And it's only when, you know, you're in bed at night and then you're actually like tired of seeing yourself in that cycle. But not only that, you start to value being out of that cycle more than being in it. And, and some certain things 
spark a person to begin to make those decisions. And sometimes those things that happen are sometimes negative. Uh, you know, maybe just, you know, over explosive arguments, someone's hit the other person, you know, these kind of things. So we do want to understand the nature of ourselves. You know, it's just like telling someone sometimes that you need to stop doing a certain thing and then they can't stop doing it until something drastic happens and they stop doing it. Why other people are like, well, before something drastic happens, let me just cut it off. So I think by even reading the question yourself over again, you can kind of understand the aspect of what you're dealing with and how that's benefiting you as a spirit being because it's not allowing you to make the decisions that you know you need to make as being a sovereign. So the question continues and T, and T says that I, I wanted to discuss addiction. Currently, I'm addicted to both cigarettes and weed, and I'm using it on a daily basis, mostly while hanging with friends and playing music and watching documentaries. And I feel as though in the spiritual realm, these things are st stigmatized and not talked about. Obviously, I know the importance of looking after these, this body. However, I developed these habits when I was younger, and they're beginning to trap me. Although I'm only 21 at the moment, my addictions are inhibiting me from being able to in, engage fully in spiritual practice. I was hoping you could discuss what addiction is from a spiritual perspective and effective pro processes to breaking addiction. Now, the first thing that I will uh, enlighten you about is that, remember, a lot of our addictions are actually hereditary. So we can be experiencing addictions from even ancestral connections, meaning, you know, great, great, great grandmother and their addictions to certain things. So be aware of that. And also understand the root and the cognate of the word drug is dragon. So I don't necessarily put marijuana in the same category as tobacco, even though they are, are actually not just tobacco, because even the cigarettes that are out today is not just tobacco. So, you know, it's very important to, to do distinguish between one from the other. However, addiction is an addiction and it does remove power from your consciousness. If some reason that you say, well, I'm not going to do this no more, but you can't find yourself, you can't find the energy to not do it. So, um, we don't want to overlook, though, those imbalances that were mentioned earlier, especially in regards to the relationship, because when we have an imbalance going on in one place, it somehow in, acts out in another way that we may not understand. Like we talked about last show, how just the child being isolated in the hospital during that first period of time that it comes out of the womb can lead to that child being very... Um, clingy, let's say, later on in life, especially in the female to the male tense. So there are many things that we experience earlier in life that act, act out in a totally different way. We've got about five minutes here, so I've got to speed through this. So I'm just going to read through. So oftentimes when we use substances in conjunction with things uh, we like to do with the body and the mind, that somehow the body and the mind get hardwired to believing that it has to do that whole formula in order for it to achieve that type of enjoyment. So this can kind of be dangerous. So you like documentaries, you like hanging out with friends, you like music. So then when you throw smoking and you throw weed into it, the body starts to think because it's still accepting the program. The body is highly programmable. The mind is programmable. We've witnessed that with MK Ultra. you know, even the biorhythmic clock of waking up at a certain time in the morning. So understand everything is programmable with the mind and the body. So the mind and the body can say, well, you know, I need this formula in order to even have fun because I enjoy to do all these together. So the more we incorporate these still addictive substances with new things, the more we increase the dependency because our life is often full of new things, hearing new information, et cetera. So, you know, if we're doing these addictive drugs and then listening to new knowledge, somehow the body and the mind say, whoa, shoot, you know, I, I only can get this level of knowledge when I'm in this formula, right? So, be, be careful of that. The only real solution I found is to dry it up, quit 22 days. Um, I think in everything you understand that AA, Alcohol Anonymous, actually contains the formula of getting uh, overcoming addictions, right? And so many of the things about it, like you have to first accept that it is addiction, are actually rooted in even spiritual principles. So especially with the cig cigarettes, because I understand cigarettes to be more of a configuration for negative energies that they're actually like, I used to call them the devil's incense, you know, not to, you know, do the God and devil thing, but they do bring around a certain kind of energy. So you do want to be really cautious of that. So during the 22 days, you should focus on how much more powerful you are than these substances. And there will be a battle 
but you will prevail, especially if you set it up like that, like you're actually in this battle with these substances. And this allows you to gain more levels of self-mastery, even if you do, let's say, decide to you know, smoke a joint every now and then after that, it will be a totally different kind of perspective that you gain from that experience. So I'm going to see exactly. Somebody did comment that Iboga does help with addictions, and I will agree that Iboga, uh, especially in micro doses, you don't have to actually go through the whole Iboga experience, but through micro doses, Iboga is more like a a very uh, strong fatherly kind of uh, energy. And so it has a tendency to come in and to really set your mind straight and to really let you see your level of being, where you're at, what's going on, and then in conjunction with all these substances who are like minors compared to who you really are. So definitely a a good uh, point to bring up. So three, uh, four more minutes left. I'll keep going. So Sean asked, Mr. Bomar, I wanted to please please ask a question regarding ceremonial magic. Uh, Dr. Israel Rigardi has two very important rituals that pertain to contact on Uh, of our guardian angels. And one is called the holy guardian angel. And the second is called the middle pillar ritual. And both allow the individual to elevate and go through doors, uh, doorways, as you would say to Jehovian base energies. And does the Keymaker series have any techniques that can help me in the conquest to know before going far down the rabbit hole to be safe and effective and not rely on ceremonies from the 1930s? And uh, to answer that question, just so we don't leave off with an unanswered question, I will say that First of all, that's what they claim. They claim to elevate, but that's actually not what's happening. The first, it's first examine the idea itself. So through ritual, which involves ev- uh, evocation of various energies, we are supposed to gain contact with a guardian angel who by the term is protecting us throughout our life. And those who, are, and those who have followed along these lines of this ritual, such as Crawley, who has his own ritual stating to do the same thing, quotes the absence of his bodily, mental, and astral consciousness is indeed cardinal to success. So you would need to understand just from that statement alone that you would actually be leaving yourself open to possession. There would be actually no one at the will for a specific period of time, and something could indeed inhabit your consciousness. Um, so in truth, this is a ritual for possession. And at minimum, it will cause a debased state of dependency and servitude toward other ideals in dark minds. Because again, if you leave yourself susceptible to believing something like this is true, then it actually leaves you more prone to being programmed. So in short, in short, the genie in the bottle, uh, this is the genie in the bottle approach. So for many, it doesn't seem logical that clearing the mind of the idea that external entities are in control and meditation and better dieting will have more effects than dark magic. However, this is a fact, meaning it is a fact that if you engage in meditation and, I, and, and leave the idea of external entities alone and get better dieting, you will have more progress than this stuff could ever deliver to you. And I go on that the danger of the ritual is actually getting bound to its ideals. That's why it's called a ritual and it must be done over and over again to, affect, to actually program you. So the society is full of this kind of thing, and especially on TV. Ceremonial magic is designed to attract those vulnerable in the gross, to the grossest ideals, meaning those who are more ready, readily able to be programmed. We must be aware of its origins and not fall into the trap of thinking a few words will create the change we are looking for. We must get familiar with the process of tapping into our inner self via the guidelines constantly laid out through the duration of this message. And this actually brings us to the end of today's message. But we will be joining each other again next Saturday. And we'll be getting more explosive. We'll be answering some more of these questions and we'll be revealing some of the deepest keys to our experience here, not only on Earth, but also beyond. Because that's what we're all about. Come to be tired, come in the likeness in the image of God. Cause you can be like that. With all that humbleness, you know that.